This is the ASUS ROG Strix RTX 2080, an overclocked beast with a hefty price tag. It's going on sale October 17th, that's tomorrow from today's filming, for around 850 US dollars. That's right, so when we compare this card to a 1080 Ti, I want you to keep that in mind. 1080 Ti's are selling for between 7 and 800 USD in the new market, making them slightly cheaper than their RTX counterparts with minimal performance losses, but again, we're talking about Pascal, not Turing. But we all know what was going on with NVIDIA in my past videos. I think that they're playing on the future of ray tracing and hoping devs catch on sooner rather than later. But if you're considering an RTX 2080 for the time being, this one from ASUS is the one you should strongly consider, and here's why. I've made my propensity to resist RTX anything but a secret these last couple of months. I do think this card is overpriced. I do think the used market holds true value at the moment, and I do believe a huge chunk of this card's architectural features will go unused for several months, if not years. Again, it all comes down to the games you play and the settings you enable. But let's assume for the intent of this video that you're sold on this generation of cards. Why is this one of the top contenders? Well, I put it through the ringer, several torture workloads, encoding scenarios, and games in 1440p and 4K. Buying this card for 1080p, by the way, makes absolutely no sense at all. I'm referring to gaming. It won't be tested in this video, so don't expect to see it. In fact, our CPU often becomes the bottleneck at this resolution, so it would make no sense to test it in this resolution anyway. Starting with this card's design, I think it's one of the sexiest on the market. It stays true to the original Strix form, but with added flair and subtle improvements basically everywhere. For starters, it sports a beefier cooler, no doubt, to accompany the roughly 225 watt TDP card, we'll talk about power draw later, and oddly enough, despite having a lower value than the 1080 Ti, Nvidia recommends a beefier power supply for its Turing lineup. This may be attributed more or less to sharper fluctuations in clock speed under load. This card does overclock just a bit, and we'll get to that soon as well. Other physical qualities I'm enjoying here, the blacked out backplate, that's a nice touch. You'll find two HDMI ports, two display ports, and and a USB Type-C port for virtual link support in VR. That'll become the standard I expect very soon. I find it strange that ASUS decided to strip its card uh, of the third DisplayPort connection. That's something the FE model does have. So if you were hoping to link up three DisplayPort monitors discreetly, you'll need to look elsewhere. That's kind of a letdown. These HDMI ports, however, are USB 2.0B compatible, meaning that you could run 1440p at a high refresh rate, assuming your monitor supports the connection as well via the same interface, which honestly is a rare find. All this to say, it's typically much easier just to deal with display ports because you know that your resolution and refresh rate are more than likely gonna be supported, which is why this is such a bummer to see. The shroud of the Strix 2080 is plastic in line with LEDs throughout. These can be changed with ASUS Aura software and or via a dedicated on-off switch built straight into the top of the card. This is convenient for those uninterested in dealing with RGBs at all, and I like the just subtle touch there. A large GeForce RTX logo spans the side of the card along with smaller Strix and ROG logos, the latter of which is LED illuminated to sync with the remainder of the lighting scheme. Also on this side are two 8-pin supplemental power connectors, something we'll be sure to test in this video. We'll grab power draw from these wires, assuming a saturated PCI slot, and take note of node temps as well, just in case you were interested in just a little more detail there. By the way, a nifty addition is a BIOS toggle dead center. P mode stands for performance and does exactly what it says, while Q mode keeps things nice and quiet at the expense of clocks, or so the claim is. So we'll be able to customize this further with GPU tweak tools and whatnot, but I do want to test that in this video. Lastly on this side is the NVLink setup. If you were wanting to tag team two of these cards, which would cost you upwards of $2,000, but that's beside the point. Now the backplate is metal and purely an aesthetic play. It carries no thermal properties since no thermal pads line the space between it and the custom PCB underneath. It's always a nice added touch that I like to look for in cards of this caliber, but I don't see that here. I am glad that the backplate does exist though, and I'm glad the ROG logo lights up again. It is better synced, by the way, with the remainder of the card's lighting scheme, so it won't say, look, blue when the LEDs elsewhere appear white. This was something I noticed with my Strix 
1070. I do want to bring up the nickel plated copper cooler one more time before diving into the benchmarks. It's definitely been upgraded over the previous gen stuff and as a result is slightly thicker than before and because Turing doesn't run too much hotter than Pascal in general, that means this card's going to run extra cool under load. Now much like its 2080 Ti sibling, this one reaches deep into the third PCIe slot, meaning things will be cramped if you decide to stash two of these in a system with a single slot between. This by the way is what you'd have to do if you intend on saturating both 16 lane slots slots on some motherboards. In fact, most of them have that single slot in between, uh, you know, two slot thick cards. Just something to keep in mind. By the way, just above the coolers are these cool fans, three of them, with blades connected to their circular chassis. We'll see how this helps or hurts the card when we run our sound tests. So starting with gaming performance, you'll find between three and five different benchmark scenarios in the upcoming graphs. I've got my trusty EVGA GTX 1080 I bought for 300 bucks, just as the value proposition in today's video, a GTX 1080 Ti gaming overclocked sent from Gigabyte, and three different passes with this card right here, depending on the scenario. I ran a couple of tests with quiet mode enabled instead of performance mode just to pick up on the margin, and I also played around with manual overclocking for the highest stable frequency I could obtain. Those were 2070 megahertz at the core and 7700 megahertz on the memory. This card was very difficult to overclock past its out-of-the-box frequencies, which are already considerably higher than its Founders Edition counterparts. So out-of-the-box was about 1950 uh, and then 7000 megahertz on memory. So very good to be honest, and that means that if you don't feel like manually overclocking, you're not going to lose much in terms of performance. These are the setups and other components used. It's the same as always. Feel free to pause if you want to look at this in more detail. Otherwise, here we go. Go. Now, something else to keep in mind while analyzing these results is that this is by no means uh, an apples to apples comparison between a 2080 and a 1080 Ti. Obviously, the GTX 1080, just plain old 1080, is at a disadvantage all around, but in the real world, we'd expect a typical 1080 Ti to keep up with a typical 2080. However, since the Gigabyte card we're using here isn't particularly beefy or enthusiast grade, I would say, the gap is slightly larger than what you might have seen uh, from other reviewers. Typically, these cards will trade below. I did manually overclock the Gigabyte card just a bit more than stock to make up for some of this difference, but both power and thermal limitations prevented me from getting very far. Starting first with the Superposition benchmark, we see a solid lead for our Strix 2080 when manually overclocked, though it oddly falls behind our 1080 Ti under stock conditions. In fact, our 1080 SC isn't even far behind these 2080 results. This is likely attributed to external optimization factors because this doesn't actually replicate itself in other tests. Another the thing we notice here is that the difference between quiet and performance profiles is entirely negligible when seen in the context of short gaming spurts. In fact, throughout my testing, the two profiles were nearly indistinguishable, which is why I stuck to the performance setting for the duration of these tests. This is just a validation of sorts. We'll discuss audible differences shortly, so stay tuned for that. Now, 3D Mark Time Spy reveals a more expected result. Our 2080 nudges out a victory under stock conditions and blows away its competition when manually overclocked past 2000 megahertz. The extreme version of this benchmark, which you're seeing here, is a 4K synthetic, just FYI. Up next is GTA 5 and 1440p in virtually max settings, save anti-aliasing. 2080 takes the cake with an average frame rate of 139, dropping to 91 among the lowest 1% of frames recorded. The 1080 Ti, mind you, wasn't far behind, only 4 frames on average, which is arguably within the margin of error at these high frame rates. Another important note, the gap between these contenders and the 1080 is quite wide so a noticeable jump there, and 4K reveals a similar story. The 2080 and 1080 Ti trade blows near 90 FPS, while the 1080 struggles to keep things above 60. This is 4K maxed after all, so it actually isn't too bad when it's seen in the context of a $300 graphics card. Now Assassin's Creed Odyssey is up next, and this thing cost me 60 bucks, and all I'll ever probably do with it is benchmark, so you better believe I threw it in this video. The 2080 and 1080 Ti achieved 64 and 62 FPS on average, respectively, while the 1080 Edge is out just under 48. 1% lows fall in line with around 45 FPS for our two more powerful cards. In 4K, things become very difficult though. I couldn't even hit 60 FPS on average with either card in the Ultra preset, and the 1080 rendered a scene that was practically unplayable. This thing crushes GPUs and frame buffers. 
2017 was a bit of a relief between our heaviest benchmarks. The 2080 clearly wins across the board here, and the 1080 closes the lead surprisingly in 4K. This game is playable in both resolutions with all cards in this Ultra preset. Shadow of the Tomb Raider was a tough one for all in question. I promised I would include this one instead of Rise of the Tomb Raider from now on. Barely 70 FPS in 1440p, just over 45 in 4K. This game was unplayable in the 4K Ultra preset with a 1080, though we shouldn't be surprised by this. One thing I did notice was the slightly higher 1% low average in the 4K resolution for the 1080 Ti. At 32 FPS, this card edged out a narrow win with respect to stuttering and lower frame rate scenarios, perhaps a testament to the current state of drivers for Turing cards. Lastly, we whipped out PUBG for a bit of fun in the Sandhawk map. In 1440p, I was pleasantly surprised. 133 FPS is no laughing matter despite the inconsistent stuttering associated with poor optimization standards. These results across the board are to be expected, nothing out of the ordinary to report on here. Now with respect to power draw under load conditions, I do want you to remember that this is a custom PCB designed for higher power tolerances, not that you'll be able to push things past about 125% or so. That's with respect to the power limit imposed by Nvidia themselves. This card, when fully maxed out, will pull approximately 310 watts from the wall, assuming a fully soaked PCIe slot. Using a clamp meter on the hot lines, running through the dual eight pins and adding 75 watts to account for PCIe draw, we're just breaking 300 watts, which puts us somewhere in the realm of 30% additional power consumption for this particular model over the FE model. Running a stock config out of the box bumps this figure down to approximately 285 watts with the same assumption, which should place most gamers in a comfortable spot with a 6 to 700 watt power supply. Though I should note that a single GPU CPU config in the consumer space at least should still be perfectly fine with something as low as a 500 watt power supply if absolutely necessary. All in all, these are the results we should expect from AIB partners with beefy custom implementations. They always consume more power than their Founders Editions or Reference Standards, uh, and this card is certainly no exception, though I think that the pros outweigh the cons in this case. A few additional comments I'd like to make. For starters, the ASUS Strix 2080 I tested had little to no coil whine, which was a nice change from the Gigabyte 1080 Ti. Uh, the coil whine on that card was louder than the fans themselves under load. Oh my gosh, and I'm being serious here. Just just a bit excessive. Another thing that struck me with the ASUS card was how quiet it was under load. Even in the performance BIOS preset, I could hear the CPU cooler more than I could the fans on the graphics card under load. And that's saying a lot because the Dark Rock TF I was using from Be Quiet is in fact, very quiet already. Temperatures under load in the performance config barely scraped 66 degrees Celsius in our Unigen Heaven loop, and with the manual overclock to roughly 2070 megahertz, that number jumped by a mere four degrees to 70 C under load. Needless to say, we had plenty of headroom left over. That's a testament to both how beefy this cooler is and how efficient the custom PCB is. It's just a shame that we couldn't push things higher uh, from voltage standpoints or just from, from power uh, limits standpoints because this card has so much more potential when it's being locked by the BIOS and by NVIDIA. Uh, so this card really is just, it's a card that you're gonna buy more or less for being quiet than for being an excellent overclocker because you'll run into other limitations apart from just thermal limitations because this card has way more headroom than it actually needs given the constraints that NVIDIA puts on it. By the way, and I hinted at this earlier, if you aren't as interested in manual overclocks, which make anywhere between a four and eight percent difference on paper, you'll be better off in the quiet BIOS config. Frame rates go virtually unchanged in situations where airflow is ample and the card stays ultra quiet in the process. The quiet mode just forces this card to uh, keep the fans a little quieter, which means that when things get a little hotter, the card's gonna, you know, down clock the, the clock on here is dynamic. It has been since Pascal you know, Maxwell does it. Uh, so when the card gets pretty hot, then the clock speed uh, the, at the core will actually drop a little bit to compensate. Uh, but because this cooler is so beefy up front, I mean, there's, there's really no thermal limitation uh, associated with this card. So it's never gonna hit a point at which the, the clock speeds need to drop significantly. And that's why I don't think there's really even a point to have a quiet versus performance performance BIOS switch on this card because that's not the issue at all here. Speaking of which, when manually overclocked, the ASUS Strix 2080 didn't exceed 46 decibels in our testing, placing it just below our EVGA 1070 Ti, which is a triple slot card and is also overclocked. This is one of the quietest cards I've ever tested, believe it or not, and without a screeching coil whine, 
will run under the radar in most rigs with decent airflow metrics. So I'm willing to conclude with my hands tied that this is one of the best RTX 2080s on the market, both in terms of performance and audible metrics. It crushes games in even the 4K resolution, and you saw here how we basically maxed out all in-game settings. So cutting back on these just a bit should yield at least 60 FPS in nearly all AAA titles today in that resolution. But the elephant in the room is, of course, the price. This thing is not cheap. It's actually about $200 more expensive than the GTX 1080 Ti I compared this to in this video, meaning from a strictly frame per dollar perspective, the RTX 2080 is a much worse value, and there's no other way to put it. The way I see it, the only reason why you should buy this card is if you plan to game in 4K but can't afford a 2080 Ti. And if price is that big of a concern to you, compromising on a 1080 Ti instead should still get the job done. I'm in a predicament here because I absolutely love this card, I just hate the prices at which these things are launching. Look, if this thing was selling for around 700 bucks, I'd be all over it and I would never recommend a 1080 Ti again. And in my opinion, that's where the price of this card should be. I think it should be around 700 to 750 bucks, but NVIDIA has other plans and that includes liquidating its excess Pascal inventory. So if you want to save money, you got to buy the older gen stuff. They're kind of forcing your hands here. It's still perfectly viable in 2018, but not the newest. And that's a problem for some people. They got to have the newest and greatest and they'll be sure to pay for it. So look, if you're going to get an RTX 2080, if you're absolutely set on the 2080 and nothing can change your mind, look here buy this one. No one's paying me to say this, and I have a few other 2080s laying around, so nothing special about how I was treated here by ASUS. I just think it's the best one of the bunch. It's the best looking, the best performing, and ouch, the most expensive. I suppose you get what you pay for, but touring is just expensive all around. And I'll always circle back to that. So I suppose we should stop here. If you guys like this video, let me know by giving this one a thumbs up. I appreciate it. Thumbs down for the opposite feeling, or if you hate everything about life, be sure to leave a comment down below not with a thumbs down, but you can leave a comment in general. I'll chat it up with you guys down there. Click the red subscribe button if you haven't already joined us. If you want to become a member, be a special member of the Science Studio family. You get a little few perks and stuff in the comment sections and live chats during live streams. I'd appreciate any support at all, including just watching the video. It goes a long way. Even if you're running ad block, who cares? You guys are contributing by watching. The view count goes up and it helps. It really does help in the long run. I hope you guys are ready for the next video. It's going to have something else to do with Turing, but we're going to do something a little out of the box here because I'm sure your inboxes at this point are flooded with Turing reviews, so uh, stay tuned for something a little unique and out of the box. This is Science Studio. Thanks for learning with us.